coverage. DataWorks Summit Europe 2017. Brought to you by Hortonworks. Welcome back everyone, live here in Munich, Germany for theCUBE's special presentation of Hortonworks Hadoop Summit, now called DataWorks 2017. I'm John Furrier, my co-host Dave Vellante. Our next guest is Sean Connolly, uh, Vice President of Corporate Strategy, um, Chief Strategy Officer. Sean, great to see you again. Thanks for having me, guys. Um, Always super, a pleasure. Super exciting. Um, obviously, we always pontificating on the status of Hadoop, and Hadoop is dead, long live Hadoop. Everyone's been demise is greatly over-exaggerated. Uh, uh, but reality is, is that no major shifts in the trends other than the fact that the amplification with AI and machine learning has up-leveled the narrative to mainstream around data. Yep. Big data has been you know, ridden on, on Gen 1 on Hadoop, that DevOps culture, open source. Started with Hadoop. You guys certainly have been way out in front on all the trends, how you guys have been rolling out the products. But it's now with IoT and AI as that the sizzle, the future, self-driving cars, smart cities, you're starting to really see demand for uh, comprehensive solutions that involve data-centric thinking. Okay, so one. Two, open source continues to dominate. MuleSoft went public, you guys went public years ago. Cloudera filed their S1. A crop of public companies that are open source yep. haven't seen that since Red Hat. Exactly, 99 is when Red Hat went public. Data-centric yep. mega trend with open source powering it you couldn't be happier for the stars lining up. Yeah, well we, we definitely placed our bets on that. We went public in you know, 2014, um, and it's nice to see that graduating class of you know, Talon, MuleSoft, you know, uh, Cloud Era coming out. Um, that just, I think, helped socialize this movement that enterprise open source, whether it's for on-prem, we're powering cloud solutions, um, pushed out to the edge, right, in technologies that are relevant in IoT, um, that's the wave. I mean, yeah. we had a panel earlier today where uh, Daljeet from Centric of British Gas was talking about his, uh, you know, the, you know, the digitization of energy, right, and virtual power plant notions. He can't achieve that without open source yeah. powering and fueling that. And, and right? the thing about it is, just kind of, for me personally, being at you know my age in this generation of computer industry from since I was 19, to see the open source go mainstream the way it is is even gets better every time. But it really is the thousand flower bloom strategy, throwing the seeds out there of innovation. I want to ask you as a strategy question, you guys, from a performance standpoint, you know, I would say kind of got hammered in the public market. Cloudera's valuation privately is 4.1 billion. You guys are close to 700 million. Certainly Cloudera's going to get a haircut, looks like, in the public market's based on the multiples from Dave and I's intro. But there's so much value being created. Where's the value for you guys, as you look at the horizon, you're talking about the white spaces that are really developing with use cases that are creating value, the practitioners in the field, yep. creating value, real value for customers. Yeah, so you, you covered some of the trends, but I'll translate them into how the customers are deploying. So um, cloud computing and IoT are somewhat related, right? One is the centralization, the other is decentralization, so it actually calls for a uh, a connected data architecture as we refer to it. Um, we were working with a variety of IOT related use cases. Um, you know, Coca-Cola uh, East Japan was, spoke at Tokyo Summit about uh, beverage replenishment analytics, getting uh, vending machine analytics from vending machines even on Mount Fuji, right? And optimizing their uh, flow through of inventory and just-in-time delivery. That's an IOT related, they run on Azure, it's a cloud related story, and it's a big data analytics story that's actually driving better margins for the business and actually better revenues because they're getting the inventory where it needs to be so people can buy it. They, th that, those are really interesting use cases that we're seeing being deployed, and it's at this con you know, convergence of IOT cloud, right, uh, and big data. Um, ultimately, that leads to AI, but I think uh, that's what we're seeing the rise can, of. Can you help us understand that sort of value chain? You got the edge, you got the cloud, you need something in between, you're calling a connected data platform. Yep. How do you guys participate in that value chain? Yeah, so um, when we went public, our primary workhorse platform was Hortworks Data Platform, right? Um, we have first class cloud services with Azure HD Insight and Hortworks Data Cloud for AWS. Curated cloud services pay as you go. And Hortworks Dataflow 
I call is our connective tissue. It's the, it manages all of your data in motion. It's like, it's a data logistics platform. It's like FedEx for data delivery. Um, it goes all the way out to the edge. There's a little comp component called Minify, Mini NiFi, which does secure intelligent analytics at the edge and transmission. And so, these smart manufacturing lines, you're, you're gathering the data, you're doing analytics on the manufacturing lines, and you're bringing the historical stuff into the data center where you can do historical analytics across manufacturing lines. Those are the use cases that a connected data are. A subset enables. of that data comes back, right? A subset I mean, of the data, yep. Like, um, the, the, the key events uh, of that data, it's not, it may not be full. 10%, uh, half, 90%? It right? depends. If you have operational uh, events that you want to store, sometimes you may want to bring full fidelity of that data so you can do, um, as if you manufactured stuff and when it got deployed and you're seeing issues in the field, uh, like Western Digital hard drives, yep. failures in the field, um, they want that data to, full fidelity of the Phone data home to, kind of to thing. do um, you know, connected data architecture yep. and analytics around that data, right? So you need to, one of the terms I use is in the new world, you need to play it where it lies. If it's out at the edge, you need to play it there. If, it's, uh, if it makes a stop in the cloud, you need to play it there. If it comes into the data center, you also need to play it there. So a couple years ago, you and I were doing a panel at our Big Data NYC event, and I used the term profitless prosperity. I got, I got like the hairy eyeball from you, I think. But, but nonetheless, we talked about you guys, as a steward of the industry, you have to invest in open source projects, and it's expensive. I mean, HDFS itself, Yarn, Tez, you guys led a lot of those initiatives. With the community, yeah, but With we the definitely yeah, but lead, you, you lead provide, the effort. You provided contributions yeah. and at least co-leadership, let's say. I yeah. mean, you're there, in yeah. the front of the pack. Um, so, how do we, projecting forward, you know, without making forward-looking statements, but how does this industry become a cash flow positive industry? Yep. So, public companies since end of 2014, the, the markets turned beginning of 2016 towards, uh, prior to that, high growth with some losses was palatable. Losses become, were not palatable. That hit us, Splunk, Tableau, most of the IT sector. That's just the nature of the public markets. Um, as more public, open source, data-driven companies will come in, I think it'll better educate the market of the value, right? So, there's only so much I can do to control the stock price. What I can, from a business perspective, is hit key measures from a path to profitability, right? So at the end of Q4 2016, we hit what we call the just the EBITDA break even, which is a, a stepping stone on our earnings call at the end of 2016, we ended with 185 million in revenue for the year, only five years into this journey, so that's a torrid revenue growth pace. And we basically stated in Q3 or Q4 of 17, we will hit operating cash flow neutrality, right? So we are operating the business. You guys also hit 100 million at record pace too, I believe. Yeah, in, the, uh, in four years, right? You know, so, so revenue is one thing, but um, operating margins, like if you look at our margins on our subscription business, for instance, we've got 84% margin on that. It's a really nice margin business, right? And we, we can make that better margins, but that's a software margin, right? Yeah, you know what's ironic? We were talking about Red Hat uh, off camera. You know, his Red Hat kicking butt, you know, really hitting uh, all, all cylinders. Three billion dollars in bookings. Yeah. One would think, okay, hey, I could maybe project forth some of these open source companies. Maybe the flip side of this, oh wow, we want it now. To your point, the market kind of flipped, but you would think Red Hat as an indicator of how an open source model can work. But it was, Red Hat went public in 99, right? So, yeah, it took a long time. you know, it was right. um, a different trajectory, like, you know, I've charted their trajectory out. Oracle's trajectory was different. They didn't, even in inflation adjusted dollars, they didn't hit 100 million uh, in four years. Oh, yeah. I think it was like seven or eight years or what have you. Salesforce did it in five, right? So these SaaS models and these subscription models and the cloud services, which is an area that's near and dear to my heart. Goes faster. Right? Is um, you get multiple revenue streams across different products. We're a multi-product yeah. cloud service company, right? Not just a single platform. So we were actually teasing this out on and our that, end. That's how you grow the business so and that's how Red Hat did it. Well, I want right? to get your thoughts on this while we're just kind of riffing live here because Dave and I were talking on our intro segment about the business model and how there's some camouflage out there, at least from my standpoint. And one of the areas that I was kind of pointing at and trying to poke at and want to get your reaction to is in the classic enterprise 
go to market. You have Salesforce expensive. You guys pay handsomely for that today. Incubating that market, getting the profitability for, is a good thing. But there's also channels, bars, ISVs, and so on. Yep. You guys have an open source channel that kind of not is a VAR or an ISV. These are entrepreneurs and or businesses themselves, right? So there's got to be a monetization shift there for you guys in the subscription business, certainly. We look at these partners, they're co-developing, they're in open source. Yep. So you, you almost can almost see the dots connecting. Yeah, it's well, this new ecosystem. I mean, there's always been an ecosystem, but now you have kind of a monetization inherently in a pure open distribution model. It forces you to collaborate, yes. right? Um, and you know, uh, IBM was on stage talking about our system certified on the power system, right? Um, many may, may look at IBM as competitive, we view them as a partner. Amazon, right? Some may view them as a uh, competitor with us, they've been a great partner in our works data cloud for AWS. And so, it forces you to think about how do you collaborate around deeply engineered syst you know, systems yeah. and value, and we get great revenue streams that are pulled through that they can sell in um, to, into the market to their ecosystem. How right? do you envision monetizing the partner? Let's just take a random, say Dave and, let's just say Dave and I start this epic idea and we create some connective tissue with your, you know, your orchestrator called the, the data platform you have, yep. and we start making some serious bank. We make a billion, a billion dollars. Do you get paid on that if it's open source? I mean, we, we need more subscriptions. So I'm trying to see how the tide comes in, whose boats float on the rising tide of the innovation in these yep. white spaces. Platform thinking is, you provide the platform, you provide the platform for 10x value that rides atop that platform. That's how the model works. So if you're riding atop the platform, I, ex I expect you and that ecosystem to drive at least 10x above and beyond what I would make as a platform provider in that space. So you expect some That's contributions. Works, right, you need a thousand flowers to be running on the platform. Well, and you know, you saw right. that in, with VMware, right? It, yep. It hit 10X, it ultimately got to 15 or 16, 17X. Exactly. I think it, they don't talk about it anymore. I think it's you maybe know, trending the other way. My days at Red Hat, it yeah. was somewhere between 15 to 20X, yeah. right, was the value that was created on top of the platforms. What right? about the, I want to ask you about the forking of the Hadoop distros. I mean, there was a time when everybody was announcing Hadoop distros. John Furrier announced Silicon Angle was announcing a <laughs> Hadoop distro. So we saw consolidation, and then you guys announced the ODP, then ODPI initiative. But there seems to be a bit of a forking in, in Hadoop distros. Is that a, a fair statement? Um, unfair? Uh, you know, I think if you look at how the Linux market played out, right, you have clearly Red Hat, you had Canonical Ubuntu, you had you know, uh, SUSE, you're always going to have curated platforms for different purposes, right? Um, we have a strong opinion um, and a strong focus in the area of IoT, um, fast analytic data from the edge, and a centralized platform with HDP in the cloud and on-prem. Um, you know, others in the market, CloudR is running sort of a different play where they're curating different you know, elements and investing in different elements. Neither, doesn't make either one bad or good. We just are going after the markets slightly differently. The other point that I'll make there is in 2014, if you looked at the Venn chart diagrams, there was a lot of overlap. Now if you draw the areas of focus, there's a, you know, there's a lot of white space that we're going after that they aren't going after and they're going after other places and other Hadoop vendors are going after <coughs> others. So it's, you know, with the market dynamics of IoT, cloud, and AI, you're going to see folks change that, different market is, is that disparity not a problem for customers though, or is it, um, or is it challenging? There has to be a core level of interoperability, and that's one of the reasons why we're collaborating with folks in the ODPI, as an example, is there's still, when it comes to some of the core components, there has to be a level of predictability, because if you're an ISV riding atop that, you're slowed down by, you know, death by infinite certification and choices, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, so ultimately, it has to come down to, you know, just uh, you know, a much more sane approach you, on when, what you can rely on. When you right? guys announced ODP, then ODPI, you know, the extension, uh, yeah. Mike Olson wrote a blog saying it's not necessary, people came out against it, now we're, I don't know, three years in? Three years in, looking back? Was he right? Or not? So I think uh, ODPI, particularly this year, there's more that we can do um, above and beyond the Hadoop platform. 
Um, it's expanded to include SQL and other things recently, so there's been some movement in this spec. But frankly, you know, I think you talk to John Murtick at ODPI, right? You talk to yep. um, you know SAS and others. I think we want to be a bit more uh, aggressive in the areas that we uh, you know go after and and try and drive there from a standardization perspective. Okay, we right. had Wei Wang on earlier. Um, there's um, more we can do, and there's more. We, we had Wei on with Microsoft at our Big Data SV event a couple weeks ago. Talk about the Microsoft relationship with you guys. It seems to be doing very well. Um, comments on that? Yeah. So. Um, Microsoft was one of the two companies we chose to partner with early on, right? So, you know, end of 2011, 2012, Microsoft and Teradata were the two, yeah. right? Um, Microsoft was how do I democratize and make this technology easy for people? That's manifests itself as Azure Cloud Service, Azure HDN. So which has been growing like crazy. Which is globally deployed, and we just had another update. We, it's fundamentally changed our engineering and delivery model. So this latest release was a cloud-first delivery model. So one of the things that we're proud of is the interactive SQL and the LLAP technology that's in HDP. That's, that went out through Azure HD Insight and Hortworks Data Cloud first, right? And then it's certified in HDP uh, 2.6 and on power, right, at the same time. So it's that cadence of delivery and cloud-first delivery model we couldn't do it without a partnership with Microsoft, right? I mean, I think we've really yeah. learned what it takes. If you look at Microsoft at that time, I remember interviewing you on the Cube. Microsoft, I think, was trading like twenty-six dollars a share at that time, or around like in their their, their low point. Yeah. Now the stock is performing really well. Satya Nutella, very cloud oriented. They're they're very open been source, very friendly. Open source yep. and friendly. They've been donating a lot to the o, um, OCP mm -hmm. for the data center piece. Mm -hmm extremely different Microsoft, so you slipped into that beautiful spot and I think, drafted on that growth. I think as you know, one of the stalwarts of enterprise software providers, I think they've done a really great job of bending the curve towards cloud and still having a mixed portfolio, but in sending a field and sending a channel and selling cloud and growing that revenue stream, yeah. um, that's non-trivial, that's hard. And right? they know they know, yeah, my, well. they know the enterprise sales motions too, so I want to ask you how that's going overall within Hortonworks. What are some of the conversations that you're involved in um, with customers today? Yeah. And obviously, again, we were saying in our opening segment, uh, that's on YouTube for anyone watching, that the customers are, is the forcing function right now. Yes. They're yeah. really putting the pressure on the suppliers, you're one of them, to get tight, reduce friction, lower cost of ownership, get into the cloud flywheel. What are and so you see? And I'll a lot throw in another uh, aspect. Some of the more late majority uh, adopters traditionally, um, over and over, I hear by 2025 they want to power down the data center and have more things running in public cloud, if not most everything. Right? That's another eight years or what have you. Um, so it's still a journey, yeah. but this journey to making that an imperative because of the operational, because of the agility, yeah. because of the uh, you know better predictability, the ease, ease of use. So as you that's get fundamental. So right? as you get into the connected tissue, I love that example yeah. with Kubernetes containers. You got developers, a big open source participant, and you got all the stuff that you have. You're going to start to see some coalescing around the cloud native. Yes. How do you guys look at that conversation? I view um, container platforms, whether container services that are running on uh, cloud or what have you, as the new light, you know, lightweight rail, right? That everything will ride atop, right? Um, and the cloud clearly plays a key role in that. I think that's going to be the de facto way, right? Yeah. Um, and particularly if you go cloud first models, particularly for delivery. Um, you, you, you know, it's sort of you need that pot packaging notion and you need the agility of updates that that's going to provide. I think Red Hat as a partner has been doing great things on hardening that, making it secure, but there's others in the ecosystem as well as the cloud providers. Um, yeah. All three cloud providers actually are investing a ton So that's in good there. for your business. It's, it, it's, um, it removes friction of deployment, my, yeah, and I, I ride atop that new, yeah. new rail, right? Oh, yeah, and also I, it can't get here soon enough from my perspective. So I want to ask you about the cloud. You were, you're talking about the Microsoft shift. I, personally, I think Microsoft realized, holy cow, we can actually make a lot of money if we're selling hardware as services. We can make more money selling the full stack. It was sort of an epiphany. And so Amazon seems to be doing the same thing. You mentioned earlier, you know, Amazon's a great partner, mm -hmm. even though a lot of people look at them as a, as a competitor. It seems like Amazon, Azure, et cetera, 
they're building out their own big data stack yes. and offering it as a service. Yep. People say that's a threat to you guys. Is it a threat or is it a tailwind? Is it, hey, we, it is what it is? So this is why I bring up industry-wise, industry-wide, we always have waves of centralization, decentralization, right? And they're playing out simultaneously right now with cloud and yeah, IoT, IoT yeah. right? And the fact of the matter is, is you're going to have multiple clouds, on-prem data, and data at the edge. That's the problem I'm looking to facilitate and solve, right? And so, so I don't view them as competitors, I view them as partners because we need to collaborate because there's a value chain of the flow of data and it's going to be, some of it's going to be running through and on those platforms. Yeah, yeah the cloud's not right. going to solve the edge problem. No. Too expensive. Exactly. Just, right? Physics. And, and so, you know, I think that's where things need to go, yeah. right? And I think that's why we talk about this notion of connected data. I don't talk hybrid cloud computing, right? That's for compute. I talk about how do you connect to your data, how do you know where your data is, and are you getting the right value out of the data where, by playing it where it lies. I think right. IoT has been a great, sweet trend for the big data industry, because it really accelerates the value proposition for the cloud, too, because now you have a connected network, you can have your cake and eat it, too. Well, and Central it, and distributed. And it, there, there's different dynamics in the U.S. versus Europe, as an example, yeah. right? So, U.S. definitely we're seeing, you know, uh, cl uh, cloud adoption, you know, that's independent of IoT. Here in Europe, I would argue the smart mobility initiatives, the smart manufacturing initiatives, and the connected grid initiatives are bringing cloud in. So it's IoT and cloud, and that's opening up the cloud opportunity hmm. here. Interesting. Right? Sean, prospects for Hortonworks cash flow positive Q4, you guys have made a public statement. Any other thoughts you want to share? Just uh, continue to uh, you know, grow the business, focus on these customer use cases, get them to talk about them at things like DataWorks right. Summit, and then um, the more the merrier, the yeah. more data-oriented, open source driven companies that yeah. can graduate in the public markets, I think is awesome. I think yeah. it'll just help the industry. Operating right. in the open with full transparency is with the, the business and the code. <laughs> and the code. <laughs> Welcome to the party, baby. Yep. Okay, this is theCUBE here at DataWorks 2017 in Munich, Germany. Live coverage, I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. Stay with us, more great coverage coming back to you after this short break.